All right, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, on such a beautiful day. And uh, I recognize that you're giving up your opportunity to do something that you waited all uh, winter to do on a nice day like today. So hope the uh, session will be productive for everyone. Um, I would like to get up and uh, be more dynamic, but uh, the uh, situation here is that one must be close to the uh, recording equipment, so I'll do my best to uh, be dynamic without uh, browbeating you. Uh, okay, so um, the way that I constructed my talk was that I had some back and forth with uh, Nicole, one of the organizers, and uh, basically we talked back and forth and got a set of questions and uh, I tried to provide some information to go with the questions. So the first question, obviously, if we're talking about nitrogen and mineralization, is what is it? So, uh, of course, if you're a scientist, uh, there's no easy answers, so you gotta show them a cycle. Um, and uh, on this cycle, I've actually left out about, you know, this is the easy nitrogen cycle. This doesn't include all of the other arrows you could put in there. Um, but simply stated, to a scientist, mineralization is the conversion of organic nitrogen to ammonium nitrogen. So it's this conversion here. Uh, what I'm gonna show you though today is that we do a lot of our measurements where we're measuring the accumulation of nitrate nitrogen. And so the reason why we do that is because the conversion of organic nitrogen is kind of slow, maybe like driving from here to Seattle after this is over with. Uh, and the conversion of, of, of ammonium to nitrates, like going from maybe Vantage to Moses Lake, quite a bit faster. So uh, we don't tend to accumulate ammonium, we tend to accumulate nitrate. And nitrate becomes the focus of management because uh, that is the form of nitrogen that can leach. Soils actually have a net negative charge. Nitrate is negatively charged, so it's not held in the soil it pretty much goes wherever the water goes. So uh, mineralization that I'm gonna talk about today is basically the accumulation of nitrate from the decomposition of organic nitrogen compounds. Uh, our uh, NRCS has uh, planning standards for manure and their definition of uh, mineralization is not exactly the same Theirs is, uh, you put on total nitrogen and mineralized nitrogen is whatever fraction of the total is plant available. So it includes the ammonium that was in the manure to begin with, plus which, that which biologically degrades from the organic nitrogen during the year. All right, so I've succeeded in confusing you. All right, so let's talk about uh, some specifics. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, rapid nitrogen release. If we use a material like broiler litter that's got uh, compounds that are very easy for the soil organisms to break down, we get decomposition of about half of it in uh, just a week or two. And accompanying that, we get our release of our nitrate nitrogen, uh, which I've called here plant available nitrogen, that's what PAN is. And so you can see that that's, uh, even though boiler litter is organic, it decomposes fast and releases nitrogen fast. So that's the fast phase. And whether it's fast or slow is kind of related to what it is as far as an organic compound goes. And on this slide, what you're seeing is at the top, those are the things that uh, microbes like to eat. Those are kind of the M&Ms of uh, microbial food. And then down at the bottom is lignin. That's kind of like getting a giant bowl of puffed wheat for breakfast in the morning. Uh, very uh, fibrous, uh, but not a lot of uh, sugars and easily degraded stuff. Uh, hemicellulose and cellulose, those are the uh, components of the cell membrane and the cell wall. So those are intermediate in uh, degradation rate. And so 
the way it works is that when the, when the organic matter goes into the soil, the uh, sugars and proteins get degraded first, followed by the uh, cell wall contents, uh, and then lignin sticks around. So we say that our soil organic matter is kind of like lignin in structure because it's a very stable, uh, the long-term organic matter in soil is uh, stable because it's difficult for the soil microorganisms to degrade. So if we look at the right side of that and we see that uh, we've got uh, different inputs that we might choose, if we're putting in crop residues that are green and leafy, like uh, plowing down a cover crop, that's going to be more like the chicken manure. If we use compost, which has been through a uh, thorough composting process, essentially composting is doing the decomposition in the pile instead of having the process go on in the soil. Uh, we don't see a lot of nitrogen release from that in the short term. So, um, I put this together in part because uh, in uh, working with students, uh, you get all these formulas and you know, they kind of get lost in the math. This is designed to show, to, to show you what the idea is that if you <coughs> apply manure one year and you apply it the next year and the next year and the next year, after a while you're getting available nitrogen from all of those years. So you kind of get to this equilibrium state where what's going into a system in terms of total nitrogen kind of becomes on the same magnitude of what's coming out. And that's an important principle in uh, nitrogen management is that uh, timing and uh, the form of nitrogen matters a lot for the first year, but if you're putting nitrogen on the, f organic nitrogen on the field year after year after year, what's really important is history. It's kind of like the Energizer Bunny. You, know, you, you wind it up and it just keeps on mineralizing and mineralizing and mineralizing. Okay, so um, I haven't mentioned biology and that's actually how this happens. That uh, you've got your uh, organic material and you've got a food web in the soil. It works just like above ground that you've got grass, that's your input, your organic matter. And then you've got various uh, trophic cycles where the material is digested and excreted by a variety of uh, grazing organisms. So if we look at the big picture on different management systems and what they do for nitrogen, we see kind of three different uh, situations. Uh, in, a, in a lot of the, in a lot of the, the uh, developing world where organic matter is scarce and they haul everything off the field, what we get there is kind of a mining situation that uh, nitrogen gets hauled off the field and never gets replaced. Uh, if we look at some of the uh, dairy situations, they're going to kind of be this higher equilibrium or building phase. And so we go through a period where uh, we're building up uh, soil organic matter, we're building up nitrogen mineralization potential, and then we kind of get to this new equilibrium level. And it takes, once we get there, it, it uh, takes a long time to come back to what it would have been at the start. Mm -hmm. So the uh, lofty goal of nutrient management everywhere would be if we could just get it exactly right. And just, you know, be right there in the middle, everything would be balanced but we find that we're not there uh, in a lot of cases. Okay, so I, I want to talk about, uh, this is my term, I'm going to call it baseline soil organic nitrogen mineralization. And that's just the mineralization that happens in our soil this year that is not the result of inputs we applied this year. So if we just, uh, Grow a, grow a crop there and the crop takes up nitrogen from the soil, that would be one way to measure how much this baseline mineralization rate is. Because we didn't put anything on, we just are, the crop is extracting what uh, has mineralized through this natural process. So it's, 
I'm going to define it as the release of nitrogen from organic matter that is fairly stable. And if we look at how much organic matter there is and how much really gets mineralized from this stable pool of organic matter, it's not a big number. We'll talk about how much it is in a minute. Uh, the decomposition process is regulated by temperature, moisture, pH, aeration. Of those uh, things, probably the two most important are temperature and moisture. Uh, so if we have uh, more decomposition of our base organic matter, then we have more mineralization. So that can be good if we want nitrogen, it can be bad uh, to have a lot of decomposition because then we're losing organic matter and we're shooting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Okay, so how do we measure this? Well, I'm embarrassed to even talk about this uh, because most scientists, you know, they have uh, really fancy uh, e e equipment to measure what they're measuring. And I'm taking soil and I'm putting it in a bag and coming back uh, after three, six, and nine weeks and measuring how much nitrate accumulated. So that's what I'm talking about, the nitrogen, the baseline mineralization rate. So if you look at this graph, temperatures going across the bottom and the amount of nitrates going up the y-axis. And you can see there's kind of a steady, almost a linear rate of nitrogen release on these soils. And these soils, I've been working more lately with uh, certified organic uh, kinds of farms. So they have some commonalities with uh, dairies in that they're putting in organic amendments on a regular basis. And uh, these mineralization rates we're seeing here are pretty high. Okay, so um, one of the questions people have is, so how important is this really? Does the crop really get much from this mineralization or is it kind of a minor thing. Well, actually, uh, it's pretty important from the crop standpoint. It's usually the case that the crop is getting about half of the nitrogen that is in the biomass of the crop at the end of the season is coming from this mineralization of organic matter that was in the soil to begin the year, not what was put on in the way of fertilizer or manure. And the way we know this is there's a couple ways you can do it. Uh, I like to use plants as kind of a bioassay and uh, dig up plants or cut them off at the ground surface, grind up the whole plant and determine how much nitrogen is in it. Uh, we did this uh, not too long ago with a uh, project with uh, organic growers that were growing potatoes. And uh, what we found was that if we applied no fertilizer, our potatoes had about 100 pounds per acre at least in their biomass, the tubers and the tops. And that uh, during the middle of the summer, we were seeing increases of about two pounds of nitrogen per acre per day. So here's a graph to show you what I just said, that uh, times going along the x-axis and uh, crop nitrogen uptake, the amount of the quantity of nitrogen in the tops and tubers is uh, on the y-axis, and what you can see is that uh, two pounds per acre per day is about the typical mineralization rate for these farms in uh, Western Oregon that have three to five percent organic matter in the soil. Okay, um, one of the conservation practices that I'm sure you're familiar with is the practice of planting cover crops in the fall, uh, and one of the reasons that uh, cover crops can be, can be beneficial, there's a lot of other reasons, but one of the reasons is that uh, they can actually capture some of the nitrogen in the form of nitrate that would otherwise uh, be lost through leaching, end up in groundwater uh, during the winter, especially if you live in Western Oregon, not so much if you're on the east side. So um, our uh, Ag engineers had a study uh, that ran about 10 years where they uh, had these uh, lysimeters and they measured the, leach the amount of nitrate leach to the lysimeters and they found that you know, if you had a good rye cover crop that got established in September, 
that you could remove about 25 pounds per acre per year from nitrogen that would have otherwise leached. So a little bit of background on that. Uh, so they were working uh, in the Willamette Valley, in the uh, southern Willamette Valley uh, groundwater management area. Here's a, a little uh, cartoon of their uh, device is basically uh, you install these uh, lysometers uh, about, a, about three feet deep under the soil profile. A lot of work to do this. And then uh, these things are equipped such that you can pump the water out and measure the uh, nitrate that's in the water. So they did this uh, on some grower fields. Uh, most of these growers were planting we're growing things that were summer vegetable crops, I think. And you can see if, they, if you looked at the uh, flow-weighted mean of nitrate nitrogen lost from these fields, uh, they're above this uh, 10 parts per million number that uh, is uh, the drinking water standard for nitrate. So if the uh, aquifer water were composed 100% of leachate from these fields, it would be above the uh, drinking water standard. Of course, you know that real groundwater is diluted by a lot of other sources. It's not pure leachate from uh, uh, vegetable fields, but it gives you an idea that uh, you know these are definitely a source, and it doesn't have to be a uh, manured situation. Uh, you can uh, get nitrate leaching. Uh, in the absence of fertilizer, and you can increase it by putting on too much fertilizer. Okay, so the, um, the work that I quoted about how much they could remove from the water, they did a, a, a long-term study at uh, one field site, and in the years that they had sweet corn for their um, summer crop, their numbers are in this red box down here that uh, when they put on 200 pounds of nitrogen fertilizer, uh, with no cover crop, they lost 60 pounds per acre. And with the cover crop, that was reduced down to 35 pounds per acre. And up, up above there, that translated into uh, a leachate concentration of 15 parts per million with no cover crop and nine parts per million with the cover crop. So I guess you could say that the cover crop was successful in this situation of taking leachate from a number above the drinking water standard to a number that was below the drinking water standard. Is it possible to meet crop needs efficiently solely with nitrogen mineralized from soil? Well, grass, perhaps. Corn, a much more difficult situation. And I, I think my question here is maybe not phrased exactly right. What I was meaning to say was that, uh, is it possible to meet your crops needs solely with organic inputs like manures and so forth? And I was calling attention here to the issue of timing. Uh, and here's the problem is that if you look at a corn crop, uh, the red line here is the nitrogen uptake curve the axis on the right there is the nitrogen that's in the biomass of the crop. And this is sweet corn, but it, it's a fairly similar to silage corn in the, in the amount of nitrogen it uses. Uh, and in this case, you're going from almost nothing the middle of June to being done with uptake uh, toward the end of July. So four or five weeks, and you've taken up 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. After that point, what the plant is doing is it's moving nitrogen that's already in the plant to the uh, developing ears as they're produced. Now there's a little bit more uptake, but not a lot. So in terms of trying to match up this situation with what the mineralization profile is, and we'll look at that in a minute, the timing isn't right here. That yes, we have mineralization that happens in June and July, but our soil doesn't shut off in August and September. It just keeps on going and going and going. So that's where we get some of this nitrate that shows up in these fall tests 
is simply that uh, our crops stop taking it up, our soil naturally keeps on chugging on its, on its uh, mineralization, and so that's the issue with uh, organic sources as a sole source is that uh, you can't really control the timing. You're at the mercy of the, uh, the environment. Okay, um, so how much of this mineralization is actually included in fertilizer guides that might be used in, in conjunction with uh, nutrient management plans? Is it included or is this, you have to add these things together? Well, I wanna inform you or tell you about how it's already in there. So you're not typically having to measure mineralization to include it in your budget. What you do have to, have to figure out is how much manure application has changed the situation from that baseline, reser that baseline number that occurs without a manure history to the current number that's based on your history of uh, manure applications. So I'm gonna show you some examples from uh, sweet corn in, in Oregon as an example. So we've been doing a little bit of work with uh, looking at a pre side dress nitrate test with some of the newer sweet corn varieties. Uh, these, these newer varieties have better root systems, they withstand root rot better, and so the thought was, do they actually perform the same as far as our uh, traditional test guidance for a mid-season nitrate test? So that's the context, but what I want to point out here is just that, look over there at where, where the nitrogen side dress rate is zero. The crop yield is about half of what the uh, total crop yield is. And these are not fields that get manure. These are just conventionally managed sweet corn fields. So in your fertilizer guides or your nutrient management guides from OSU, WSU, or U of I, uh, the way they came up with those guides was they did trials like this with different nitrogen rates. And so that mineralization is built into the system. The normal mineralization rate that happens in a conventional system. So really what we're trying to account for in manure plans is uh, how much we've changed the mineralization rate over time. And that's why we look at what's, how long has this been in manure and what is the long-term effect. Um, just an idea that uh, you can go to just about any field you want in the Willamette Valley and you can measure how much nitrogen the crop takes up without fertilizer and how much it takes up with fertilizer. And you get a number that uh, the crop's getting about two thirds of what's in the biomass from the mineralization. Because uh, if you look at the red bars, those are grower fields fertilized however they fertilize them. And the blue bars are what was measured on a small piece of the field that uh, where a fertilizer was withheld. So you can see this uh, mineralization is, it's an important part of a nitrogen budget, whether you're manured or you're not manured, it's kind of concealed uh, in the typical fertilizer guide because of uh, this phenomenon that, uh, you know, the tests were done under conditions where, where mineralization was happening, but uh, it's all part of what's in there. Okay, so what's the effect of temperature? Well, the uh, default statement on this is that uh, mineralization is biological process and biological processes typically obey the uh, Q10 kind of rule that the, the rate of the process doubles with every 10 degrees increase in uh, temperature. So 18 degrees Fahrenheit is 10 degrees C. Uh, so here's some data that actually comes from Washington. Uh, long ago when uh, I was working with uh, Andy Berry, uh, Andy actually collected most of this data, um, or all of this data in this particular graph. Uh, so what uh, Andy did was he went to Whatcom County and uh, he uh, worked with the conservation district, I think, 
and they found some fields that had the same soil series, the same mapping unit, and they found fields that were pretty close to each other that had either a manure history, they were dairy, or a not manure history, meaning that they were some other kind of uh, land use that was comparable. So um, Andy got all of his soil samples, brought them all back, and uh, he put them in the, these little uh, microplot cylinders and measured the mineralization rate during the year. And I, I don't want to get into all the details of the method, but just look at the rate of mineralization that happened in these soils between June and about September 1. Very rapid kinds of mineral, lots of mineralization going on in these soils. And look at the effect of the manure history. The manure history in a lot of these soils, you know, increases the rate by the overall mineralization rate by maybe one and a half to two times. So usually the fraction that we say is mineralizing annually as a baseline number is somewhere between 1% and 4% of the total nitrogen. Uh, in the case of that microplot study that Andy did, uh, we did the numbers and the numbers came in somewhere between one and four percent with the manured fields being more like uh, two to four and the baseline being more like one to three percent. Does, does mineralization stop during the winter months? Well, if it's frozen, uh, probably, but uh, where I'm familiar with measurements in Oregon, uh, our average uh, soil temperature is about seven degrees C during the winter. And there's been a couple studies where people have been brave and tromped out the fields in the winter and uh, done these measurements. And they've done different methods, but they find uh, rates of mineralization that are not zero. Uh, one study that was done with conventional ryegrass uh, near Albany, average rate is about half a pound per acre per day. Uh, Dean Moberg, who's an NRCS uh, conservationist in Hillsborough, did a graduate degree with uh, Oregon Graduate Institute in Al Aloha, and for part of his work, he did uh, uh, soil cores to look at mineralization during the winter. And he found, you know, pr some pretty variable rates, but uh, kind of in the same ballpark as these rates reported by the other research. So, so then comes the question whether if you put on manure during the winter, will the grass use the nitrogen? And we have research to say that yes, it will, uh, provided that, uh, you know, the history is not such that you have huge mineralization rates as a result of history. And we have a research to say that uh, really, uh, if you're in grass, the timing of application, uh, as long as you don't overdo it in the winter, is probably not a huge deal. Uh, this particular research was done up at Buckley uh, near uh, Enumclaw. And uh, this was done in, in collaboration with uh, Craig Cogger, Andy Berry, and Steve Franson. And so uh, I worked on this project, uh, and we had the, the luxury of uh, getting to apply manure on um, Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th, Valentine's Day. Uh, so we were out there uh, applying manure whenever uh, throughout the year. And here's our uh, plots, uh, different manure rates going on there. So we applied the same rate to all of our treatments. And the goal was to look at, you know, what was the effect of timing. So we had a sequence where it all went on uh, before May. That was the early one. We had a late plus early where we applied it both at uh, Valentine's Day and in October and applied some during the summer. So you can get the idea that we tried every possible combination of timings here. We had two soils. We had one that was uh, basically uh, a pile of sand. 
and one that was very poorly drained that was, uh, had uh, tile drainage. So what we were thinking was that, that winter application was going to have lower <laughs> nitrogen utilization efficiency because of the opportunity for the nitrogen to leach or denitrify during the winter. Uh, so just to show you, you know, that uh, the grass really responded to the winter application. So this is what this site looked like on the sand with no fertilizer. Uh, not a lot of organic matter in this soil and not very outstanding grass growth. Uh, plot right next to it that got the November manure application and a huge difference in the uh, plant growth. So there's no doubt that the grass grew better with the winter manure application in a system, we were, we were working on a field that had not had manure before. So that's very important. So if we look at the effect of timing, basically we got about 30, 35% of our nitrogen uh, released, taken up by plants during the uh, first year after application. So the, the conclusion from this was that uh, Really, the scheduling is not a huge uh, issue. Um, we're in a system where we haven't uh, used manure before and we're not putting on huge nitrogen rates. So remember that. Okay, and then finally, um, when I was here in Washington, uh, I developed a, uh, I guess, a index of uh, management in terms of if you had a soil sample in the fall, you, what it, the soil samples taken in the fall were designed to look at uh, nitrogen management and reflect back on what had happened during the year. Uh, that test is called the post-harvest nitrate test. Some people call it the uh, fall nitrate test. Others call it the uh, report card test. Uh, and I wanted to address two things that I saw in the literature here recently from uh, some reports from Washington. Uh, one is, uh, is this test uh, intended to predict plant response to winter manure applications? <coughs> what do you think? Is that the purpose of it? Uh, how about, is it intended to predict the loss of nitrate to groundwater? Okay, those that are answering are getting this all right. Um, okay, so here's the publication we're talking about. Uh, soil nitrate testing is a snapshot in time. The nitrate's water soluble, so it's going where the water goes. Uh, the idea of the fall sampling is to look at the crops removed, what it's gonna remove, and you're looking at the nitrate that's there before it has a chance to leach. So the way this works is that as long as the crop is growing in response to nitrogen input, uh, soil nitrate stays low. When uh, you get beyond what the crop can take up, then soil nitrate accumulates. Well, this is obviously a very important slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, what I was going to tell you was that uh, basically the soil nitrate test is uh, an indicator of system performance that if the number's high, then it means that there's something in your system that's giving you more nitrogen than the crop actually needs. It's not a smoking gun that says you put on too much manure. Uh, it was never intended to um, predict anything about groundwater. 
uh, it only samples one foot of soil because on the soils that um, occur in Whatcom County where this work was calibrated, kind of, the soils there, uh, we tried sampling to three feet. Uh, Chuck uh, Timbland, uh, where are you at? Chuck uh, will attest that uh, if you want to spend a lot of money on soil probe tips, you should sample to three feet because <laughs> you start hitting rocks and everything. Uh, but what we actually did find in those samples that Chuck did to three feet was that 80% of our nitrogen was in the top foot. So sampling the top foot was actually a good way to get an idea of what was in the overall soil. Well, this is really a good slide. <laughs> so I, w I wanted them to talk about uh, um, the uh, phosphorus index uh, after concluding my talk on nitrogen. And what I was going to say about that primarily was that uh, the, uh, all right. Uh, okay, so I just told you this, that we're looking back in time, trying to see if uh, we have more nitrogen than we need. <coughs> and all we're doing is saying that uh, if the crop didn't take it up and it's there in the fall, then it must have been too much. So we're getting a general idea of the balance. Uh, we're identifying fields that are uh, more highly endowed with nitrate than others. Uh, we're not trying to, to do anything with predicting nitrogen needs for the next year uh, or determining whether it's manure or whether it's mineralization or whether it's uh, some other nitrogen input. Uh, we're not trying to predict whether we need more manure in the fall for the grass. And we're not trying to predict uh, how much nitrate uh, is potentially lost to groundwater. So the danger in creating a test is that people will use your test for whatever, for their, for their own, uh, I'm not saying that there isn't some perhaps correlation with some of these things, but uh, that wasn't the goal of the test. All right, so uh, I put this in as kind of, uh, you know, somebody happy uh, in between nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, and because uh, we're getting a lot of news from Ukraine uh, this is uh, from Moldova, which is Ukraine's neighbor, and I was there uh, advising on fertilization uh, a couple years ago. And, uh, you know, all these guys you see on TV are not very stylish. You know, these uh, guys that are taking over the government buildings. And so uh, I thought I wanted to show you that, you know, in fact, uh, they do have some stylish uh, people in that part of the world. All right. Uh, so now... Let's talk about phosphorus. <laughs> okay, phosphorus is a different problem than nitrogen in that the problem with nitrogen is that it's soluble and we get it in groundwater. And the problem with phosphorus is that it's not very soluble and it tends to run off the soil surface and contaminate uh, water, surface water bodies. So it's a surface water pollutant primarily. We can get phosphorus moving in tile drains if we have preferential flow through soil, but our primary route of phosphorus loss is from either soil erosion or surface runoff. Uh, phosphorus is getting a lot of attention nationally. Uh, this is Lake Erie in a recent year, and uh, most of this most of the phosphorus load to Lake Erie is agricultural, about 70%. And they thought that they had uh, done a good job of reducing phosphorus inputs, but uh, apparently the system is a little bit more complicated than they thought. I don't have time to get into the details there, but uh, when you're having this much impact on a water body in a highly populated area, this starts getting a lot of national attention. So uh, the last time that phosphorus reared its head was uh, 
the mid-90s, we had a, a death of um, fish off of uh, the coast of uh, North Carolina. And they were killed by this toxic dinoflagellate bloom, something called Fisteria. And so following that, we had Fisteria hysteria, which resulted in pointing the finger at uh, chickens and phosphorus on the East Coast. So that all worked its way through policy, and we had a phosphorus index 10 years later. So what a phosphorus index is, it's a very crude model, uh, or in more academic terms, a field scale quantitative, qualitative assessment of relative risk. And it's designed to be simple enough for conservation districts and NRCS to use and uh, use that in conservation planning. So the goal of the original phosphorus indexes was to prioritize fields for uh, conservation practices, fields that were contributing the most to water quality degradation should be getting the most attention as far as uh, conservation practice. So there are multiple factors considered in terms of rating phosphorus loss from low to high. Here's some of the factors. Basically, they, they divide up into two uh, categories. Uh, how much phosphorus there is. That's the potential for uh, how much there is is uh, termed here the uh, source factors, measurements of soil test phosphorus, how much phosphorus is being put on with fertilizer or manure. And if phosphorus is being left on the surface, it's more susceptible to loss. So method of application comes into it. And then you've got this, the uh, properties of your uh, field, how much soil erosion there is and runoff and these were combined into an overall score. And the score was rated low, medium, low, moderate, or high. So in 2013, um, there were some changes in, in, uh, in NRCS policy. The new 590 has three categories of um, phosphorus risk. If you're low risk, your, your, your nutrient plan can be nitrogen-based. If you're moderate risk, it needs to be phosphorus-based and limited to phosphorus removal. And then according to the NRCS, NRCS guidelines, if it's high risk, then you have to do some additional measures. So um, as far as the science goes, I, I wanted to uh, share with you that I have pretty high confidence in the fact that soil testing is a good way to characterize the uh, contribution of soil to uh, phosphorus pollution. And that's because uh, there's been a lot of studies to show that the regular soil tests we use for figuring out if we need fertilizer or not, the Bray or the Olson tests, they're pretty highly correlated to other measures of phosphorus like water-soluble phosphorus or other environmental tests. So actually, those agronomic tests do a pretty good job of um, serving as a relative risk criteria for soil phosphorus. Uh, there have been lots of studies to look at this kind of a relationship. Uh, there's been a national group that uh, went out and did a lot of soil testing and then ran around with rainfall simulators. Uh, to catch runoff from simulator plots and correlate the soil test value to the runoff phosphorus values. So that's what I'm talking about. There's a lot of this data from around the country. Oregon and Washington and Idaho uh, didn't participate in this very highly, but really soil is not incredibly different. Uh, so I think this still works in uh, Oregon and Washington. In Oregon, we did some uh, lab measures of water-soluble phosphorus and uh, other environmental tests, and we found that it correlated pretty well with our Bray soil test value. So here's the kind of numbers and their uh, relative risk of uh, phosphorus in the current P-index. So west of the Cascades, we're using this Bray soil test. So if you're greater than uh, 60, then you're getting into the range where you'd be considered uh, having higher risk. 
if you're east of the Cascades and you're, and you're uh, greater than 40, then you're getting into that zone. Okay, I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to uh, skip to the end and just show you that uh, here's the new phosphorus index that's being worked on at the, uh, the NRCS Technical Center in Portland. Uh, this is the result of meetings that were had with uh, university folks, uh, ecology, Department of, of Environmental Quality, uh, your, uh, what's the name of your outfit, Jenny? Okay, the, uh, and then the Oregon version of that in the Department of Ag that we uh, spent uh, three fun-filled days uh, talking about uh, uh, this and the uh, tech rep from NRCS spent a lot of time working with me and working with uh, modelers that are far more into this than I am. And they have a, a beta version of a phosphorus index that's going to be organized a little bit differently. The principles of it will be the same as the old index. Uh, the reason why they're changing the index primarily is that uh, for policymakers in Washington, D.C., they found it uh, interesting but uh, not helpful to, to know that we had 50 states and 50 phosphorus indexes. So this is an effort to try and have more of a uh, systematic approach that can be applied across the country. Okay, so with that, I think I will uh, take some questions, perhaps. Okay, so the, the question comes, I think, from probably the Sunnyside area, I'm guessing. Yes. And uh, the producer or conservationist, I'm not... Anyway, the question relates to uh, if you've got a system where uh, your soil test is uh, medium to high and you see plants that are looking purple, that are corn plants, and where you put phosphorus fertilizer, they're not purple, uh, how does this all relate to this p-index? So, um, a couple of things. One is that um, there's not always a really strong correlation between plants that look purple and the final yields. That uh, a lot of times they look purple for a while, they grow out of it, and in the end uh, there's not a huge difference in the yields. So that's just a bio biology thing that um, uh, oftentimes it looks way worse in the spring than it turns out in the end. Uh, the other aspect is that, you know, really uh, if you're going to put phosphorus uh, next to corn seeds at seeding time, there's ways to do that that you're not putting on very much phosphorus. So um, I think, you know, if you've got a demonstrated response to the phosphorus, then a really uh, modest rate of phosphorus going on, you know, at seeding time is kind of a reasonable compromise, I think. Uh, we've been doing work in Oregon, actually, with our sweet corn growers on uh, 
phosphorus, and we've done, um, I think we're up to six site years where we have uh, different phosphorus rates and uh, we're trying to plant sweet corn as, as early as possible to get the most phosphorus uh, problem. And we're not seeing any problems. Our soil tests are usually, we don't have any that are considered low. We don't have any that are considered medium. We have some that are 60 on a bray or something like that, all the way up to 150. Uh, and these are producers that they always apply phosphorus because that was the OSU guidance for many years that you always need phosphorus. Uh, what we find is that, uh, you know, if you do need phosphorus, when you get up to those soil test values, you don't need very much. And the probability of response is pretty low. Okay, so two questions. The first one had to do with um, if you have anaerobically digested manure solids, uh, how will they mineralize in terms of nitrogen? So I have limited uh, data on this. Uh, I think my uh, number of replicates is uh, one. Uh, what we found with it was that it was not dramatically different than the normal separated dairy solids, you know, the ones that just come out of the mechanical separators. Yeah, that, so that aren't digested. The main difference was that uh, the digested solids had more ammonium. Ammonium being, you know, basically fertilizer nitrogen because anaerobically you're converting nitrogen to ammonium in the digester. So if you have some of the liquid comes with the solids when you put them out. So anyway, there's more nitrogen right away, not a lot, but as far as the actual nitrogen availability, it was still, I think, less than 10% of the total. Pretty, pretty uh, modest kind of uh, nitrogen from the first year. And the other way to think of it is that basically if you're digesting, it's sort of like liquid composting. So you're kind of making compost in a liquid environment. So you don't expect there to be a lot of uh, mineralization from the organic fraction in that case. Okay, so the second question, uh, I didn't exactly understand, but I think it was uh, conversions with phosphorus and soil tests. Oh. Usually it's a 3.2 multiplier for non-organic soils, so the higher organic soils was a good way to, for a scaled conversion to the organic matter Okay, so basically where those numbers come from, uh, when you convert parts per million to pounds per acre, is you're considering how deep your sample is, how much uh, depth you have, and so if the normal number we have is that uh, we know that an acre foot of water weighs 2.7 million pounds. And we know that a typical mineral soil uh, might have a bulk density of 1.3. So it's heavier than water. So if we multiply 1.3 times 2.7, that's where we get the that's where we get the normal factor is just the bulk density times the weight of water per acre. So in the case of organic soils, they have a bulk density that's less than one often. So their number is going to be maybe 2.5 or less than that. I don't know. It's going to, but you can figure it out easily just based on uh, 
an approximate bulk density number. Okay. Yeah. We have about five more minutes for questions. We have two quick ones here. Thanks. Uh, I haven't looked deeply into the new P index. I'm wondering what the cost buck is. The, the, the one we've been operating under says uh, P balance when you go to high rating, and the new one we're talking about going to P balance with a medium rating. Is it going to be a higher level of management or is it just a different uh, scale? So I guess uh, your questions have to do with policy. And so uh, I get a free pass not to uh, comment on that one. Um, Can you save it for the uh, conversation about policy? Yeah, and, and um, one thing I didn't maybe explain clearly was that the new spreadsheet index uh, while it is, uh, you know, the, the concept is good, uh, it, is, it, has not been, it has not gone through the phase of uh, intense beta testing to basically run some fields and see if the numbers make any sense. So that all has to go on, I think, before you consider it to be a standard that you're going to use for decision making. So I'm not the one that is responsible for that step and the schedule with that and how that interplays with the policy. But that'll take a while, I think. Yeah. Hi, Dan. Karen Hills, King Conservation District. I was just wondering if you could clarify um, the timing of the post-harvest nitrate test in um, dairy situations where manure is being applied in the fall and, of course, on the west side here, the rain yeah. begins in the fall. Could you just because I've heard some different guidance given yeah. on that. So if you look in the uh, publication that uh, was in the presentation, it's got fairly explicit guidance there. It says that um, as a rule of thumb, if you look at uh, rainfall or irrigation after September 1, by the time you've accumulated five inches, it's too late. So, um, Typically, the way it works out for most locations is that uh, September is a fine time to do it. it. Usually works in October up to about October 15th. And after October 15th, uh, you're living on borrowed time in terms of actually, you know, doing it the way the guidance is there. Um, so that's the general guidance. When you start talking about specifics, on a specific field, then you get into all sorts of other questions. Um, and uh, we had another session a few years ago where uh, we talked about all those things. And so if you look at that publication, it's got a lot of the what ifs there in terms of you know, how you decide what's the best time. Uh, what you don't want to do is you don't want to take this test af the day after the manure goes on because it's not the post manure application test. It's really intended to look at a situation where manure hasn't, been, hasn't gone on late in the season. And you know, so you have reasonable management that way. And so you know, did that management actually work out? And do you get a number that isn't excessive in the fall? That's really what it's intended for. So if you have fields where they're putting manure on, just skip those fields, I think. Because uh, you you know you know what manure has in it and you know what you're measuring so yeah great thank you Dan I think we're gonna.